Jewels of Gwalur Conan's amour with Valeria does not last long. Perhaps the fact that each of them insists on being the boss has something to do with the fact. At any rate, they part. Valeria to return to the sea, Conan to try his luck in the Black Kingdoms. Hearing of the priceless teeth of Gwalur, a fortune in ancient jewels hidden somewhere in Kishan, he sells his services to the irascible king of Kishan to train his armies for war against the neighboring kingdom of Punt. 1. Paths of Intrigue The cliffs rose sheer from the jungle, towering ramparts of stone that glinted jade blue and dull crimson in the rising sun, and curved away and away to east and west above the waving emerald ocean of fronds and leaves. It looked insurmountable, that giant palisade with its sheer curtains of solid rock in which bits of quartz winked dazzlingly in the sunlight. But the man who was working his tedious way upward was already halfway to the top. He came from a race of hillmen, accustomed to scaling forbidding crags, and he was a man of unusual strength and agility. His only garment was a pair of short red silk breeks, and his sandals were slung to his back, out of his way, as were his sword and dagger. The man was powerfully built, supple as a panther. His skin was bronzed by the sun, his square-cut black mane confined by a silver band about his temples. His iron muscles, quick eyes, and sure feet served him well here, for it was a climb to test these qualities to the utmost. A hundred and fifty feet below him waved the jungle. An equal distance above him, the rim of the cliffs was etched against the morning sky. He labored like one driven by the necessity of haste. Yet he was forced to move at a snail's pace, clinging like a fly on a wall. His groping hands and feet found niches and knobs, precarious holes at best, and sometimes he virtually hung by his fingernails. Yet upward he went, clawing, squirming, fighting for every foot. At times he paused to rest his aching muscles, and, shaking the sweat out of his eyes, twisted his head to stare searchingly out over the jungle, combing the green expanse for any trace of human life or motion. Now the summit was not far above him, and he observed only a few feet above his head a break in the sheer stone of the cliff. An instant later he had reached it, a small cavern just below the edge of the rim. As his head rose above the lip of its floor, he grunted. He clung there, his elbows hooked over the lip. The cave was so tiny that it was little more than a niche cut in the stone, but it held an occupant, a shriveled brown mummy, cross-legged, arms folded on the withered breast upon which the shrunken head was sunk, sat in the little cavern. The limbs were bound in place with rawhide thongs, which had become mere rotted wisps. If the form had ever been clothed, the ravages of time had long ago reduced the garments to dust. But thrust between the crossed arms and the shrunken breast, there was a roll of parchment, yellowed with age to the color of old ivory. The climber stretched forth a long arm and wrenched away this cylinder. Without investigation, he thrust it into his girdle and hauled himself up until he was standing in the opening of the niche. A spring upward, and he caught the rim of the cliffs and pulled himself up and over almost with the same motion. There he halted, panting, and stared downward. It was like looking into the interior of a vast bowl rimmed by a circular stone wall. The floor of the bowl was covered with trees and denser vegetation, though nowhere did the growth duplicate the jungle denseness of the outer forest. The cliffs marched around it without a break and of uniform height. It was a freak of nature, not to be paralleled perhaps in the whole world. A vast natural amphitheater, a circular bit of forested plain, three or four miles in diameter, cut off from the rest of the world and confined within the ring of those palisaded cliffs. But the man on the cliffs did not devote his thoughts to marveling at the topographical phenomenon. With tense eagerness he searched the treetops below him, and exhaled a gusty sigh when he caught the glint of marble domes amidst the twinkling green. It was no myth, then. Below him lay the fabulous and deserted palace of Alcminon. Conan the Cimmerian, late of the Baraka Isles, of the Black Coast, and of many other climes where life ran wild, had come to the kingdom of Kishan following the lure of a fabled treasure that outshone the horde of the Turanian kings. Kishan was a barbaric kingdom lying in the eastern hinterlands of Kush, where the broad grasslands merge with the forests that roll up from the south. The people were a mixed race, a dusky nobility ruling a population that was largely pure Negro. The rulers, princes and high priests, 
claimed descent from a white race, which, in a mythical age, had ruled a kingdom whose capital city was Alcminon. Conflicting legends sought to explain the reason for that race's eventual downfall and the abandonment of the city by the survivors. Equally nebulous were the tales of the teeth of Gwalur, the treasure of Alcminon. But these misty legends had been enough to bring Conan to Kishan over vast distances of plain, river-laced jungle and mountains. He had found Kishan, which in itself was considered mythical by many northern and western nations, and he had heard enough to confirm the rumors of the treasure that men called the Teeth of Gwalur. But its hiding place he could not learn, and he was confronted with the necessity of explaining his presence in Kishan. Unattached strangers were not welcome there. But he was not nonplussed. With cool assurance he made his offer to the stately, plumed, suspicious grandees of the barbarically magnificent court. He was a professional fighting man. In search of employment, he said, he had come to Kishan. For a price he would train the armies of Kishan and lead them against Punt, their hereditary enemy, whose recent successes in the field had aroused the fury of Kishan's irascible king. This proposition was not so audacious as it might seem. Conan's fame had preceded him even into distant Kishan. His exploits as a chief of the Black Corsairs, those wolves of the southern coasts, had made his name known, admired, and feared throughout the Black Kingdoms. He did not refuse tests devised by the dusky lords. Skirmishes along the borders were incessant, affording the Sumerian plenty of opportunities to demonstrate his ability at hand-to-hand -hand fighting. His reckless ferocity impressed the lords of Kishan, already aware of his reputation as a leader of men and the prospects seemed favorable. All Conan secretly desired was employment to give him legitimate excuse for remaining in Kishan long enough to locate the hiding place of the teeth of Gwalur. Then there came an interruption. Thutmekri came to Kishan at the head of an embassy from Zimbabwe. Thutmekri was a Stygian, an adventurer and a rogue whose wits had recommended him to the twin kings of the great hybrid trading kingdom, which lay many days' march to the east. He and the Sumerian knew each other of old, and without love. Thutmekri likewise had a proposition to make to the king of Kishan, and it also concerned the conquest of Punt, which kingdom, incidentally, lying east of Kishan, had recently expelled the Zimbabwean traders and burned their fortresses. His offer outweighed even the prestige of Conan. He pledged himself to invade Punt from the east with a host of black spearmen, Shemitish archers, and mercenary swordsmen, and to aid the king of Kishon to annex the hostile kingdom. The benevolent kings of Zimbabwe desired only a monopoly of the trade of Kishon and her tributaries, and, as a pledge of good faith, some of the teeth of Gwalur. These would be put to no base usage, Thutmekri hastened to explain to the suspicious chieftains. They would be placed in the temple of Zimbabwe beside the squat gold idols of Dagon and Dukerto sacred guests in the holy shrine of the kingdom, to seal the covenant between Kishan and Zimbabwe. This statement brought a savage grin to Conan's hard lips. The Sumerian made no attempt to match wits and intrigue with Thutmekri and his Shemitish partner, Zargeba. He knew that if Thutmekri won his point, he would insist on the instant banishment of his rival. There was but one thing for Conan to do, find the jewels before the king of Kishan made up his mind and flee with them. But by this time he was certain that they were not hidden in Kashia, the royal city, which was a swarm of thatched huts crowding about a mud wall that enclosed a palace of stone and mud and bamboo. While he fumed with nervous impatience, the high priest Gorulga announced that before any decision could be reached, the will of the gods must be ascertained concerning their proposed alliance with Zimbabwe, and the pledge of objects long held holy and inviolate. The oracle of Alcminon must be consulted. This was an awesome thing, and it caused tongues to wag excitedly in palace and beehive hut. Not for a century had the priests visited the silent city. The oracle, men said, was the princess Yaleya, the last ruler of Alcmenon, who had died in the full bloom of her youth and beauty, and whose body had miraculously remained unblemished throughout the ages. Of old, priests had made their way into the haunted city, and she had taught them wisdom. The last priest to seek the oracle had been a wicked man, who had sought to steal for himself the curiously cut jewels that men called the teeth of Gwalur. But some doom had come upon him in the deserted palace, 
from which his acolytes, fleeing, had told tales of horror that had, for a hundred years, frightened the priests from the city and the oracle. But Garulga, the present high priest, as one confident in his knowledge of his own integrity, announced that he would go with a handful of followers to revive the ancient custom, and in the excitement tongues buzzed indiscreetly, and Conan caught the clue for which he had sought for weeks, the overheard whisper of a lesser priest that sent the Cimmerian stealing out of Kishia the night before the dawn when the priests were to start. Riding as hard as he dared for a night and a day and a night, he came in the early dawn to the cliffs of Alcminon, which stood in the southwestern corner of the kingdom, amidst uninhabited jungle which was taboo to common men. None but the priests dared approach the haunted vale within a distance of many miles, and not even a priest had entered Alcminon for a hundred years. No man had ever climbed these cliffs, legend said, and none but the priests knew the secret entrance into the valley. Conan did not waste time looking for it. Steeps that balked these black people, horsemen and dwellers of plain and level forest, were not impossible for a man born in the rugged hills of Samaria. Now on the summit of the cliffs, he looked down into the circular valley and wondered what plague, war, or superstition had driven the members of that ancient white race forth from their stronghold to mingle with and be absorbed by the black tribes that hemmed them in. This valley had been their citadel. There the palace stood, and there only the royal family and their court dwelt. The real city stood outside the cliffs. Those waving masses of green jungle vegetation hid its ruins. But the domes that glistened in the leaves below him were the unbroken pinnacles of the royal palace of Alcminon, which had defied the corroding ages. Swinging a leg over the rim, he went down swiftly. The inner side of the cliffs was more broken, not quite so sheer. In less than half the time it had taken him to ascend the outer side, he dropped to the swarded valley floor. With one hand on his sword, he looked alertly about him. There was no reason to suppose men lied when they said that Alcminon was empty and deserted, haunted only by the ghosts of the dead past. But it was Conan's nature to be suspicious and wary. The silence was primordial. Not even a leaf quivered on a branch. When he bent to peer under the trees, he saw nothing but the marching rows of trunks receding and receding into the blue gloom of the deep woods. Nevertheless, he went warily, sword in hand, his restless eyes combing the shadows from side to side, his springy tread making no sound on the sward. All about him he saw signs of an ancient civilization. Marble fountains, voiceless and crumbling, stood in circles of slender trees whose patterns were too symmetrical to have been a chance of nature. Forest growth and underbrush had invaded the evenly planned groves, but their outlines were still visible. Broad pavements ran away under the trees, broken, and with grass growing through the wide cracks. He glimpsed walls with ornamental copings, lattices of carven stone that might once have served as the walls of pleasure pavilions. Ahead of him through the trees, the domes gleamed, and the bulk of the structure supporting them became more apparent as he advanced. Presently, pushing through a screen of vine-tangled branches, he came into a comparatively open space where the trees straggled, unencumbered by undergrowth, and saw before him the wide-pillared portico of the palace. As he mounted the broad marble steps, he noted that the building was in far better state of preservation than the lesser structures he had glimpsed. The thick walls and massive pillars seemed too powerful to crumble before the assault of time and the elements. The same enchanted quiet brooded over all. The cat-like pad of his sandaled feet seemed startlingly loud in the stillness. Somewhere in this palace lay the effigy or image which had in times past served as oracle for the priests of Kishon. And somewhere in the palace, unless that indiscreet priest had babbled a lie, was hidden the treasure of the forgotten kings of Alcminon. Conan passed into a broad lofty hall, lined with tall columns between which arches gaped, their doors long rotted away. He traversed this in a twilight dimness, and at the other end passed through great double-valved bronze doors which stood partly open as they might have stood for centuries. He emerged into a vast domed chamber which must have served as audience hall for the kings of Alcminon. It was octagonal in shape, and the great dome up to which the lofty ceiling curved obviously was cunningly pierced, for the chamber was much better lighted than the hall which led to it. At the farther side of the great room there rose a dais with broad lapis lazuli steps leading up to it, and on that dais there stood a massive chair with ornate arms and a high back 
which once doubtless supported a cloth of gold canopy. Conan grunted explosively, and his eyes lit. The golden throne of Alcmenon, named in immemorial legendary. He weighed it with a practiced eye. It represented a fortune in itself, if he were but able to bear it away. Its richness fired his imagination concerning the treasure itself, and made him burn with eagerness. His fingers itched to plunge among the gems he had heard described by storytellers in the market squares of Kishia, who repeated tales handed down from mouth to mouth through the centuries. Jewels not to be duplicated in the world. Rubies, emeralds, diamonds, bloodstones, opals, sapphires, the loot of the ancient world. He had expected to find the oracle effigy seated on the throne, but since it was not, it was probably placed in some other part of the palace, if indeed such a thing really existed. But since he had turned his face toward Kishan, so many myths had proved to be realities that he did not doubt that he would find some kind of image or god. Behind the throne there was a narrow arched doorway, which doubtless had been masked by hangings in the days of Alcmenon's life. He glanced through it and saw that it led into an alcove, empty, and with a narrow corridor leading off from it at right angles. Turning away from it, he spied another arch to the left of the dais, and it, unlike the others, was furnished with a door. Nor was it any common door. The portal was of the same rich metal as the throne, and carved with many curious arabesques. At his touch it swung open so readily that its hinges might recently have been oiled. Inside he halted, staring. He was in a square chamber of no great dimensions, whose marble walls rose to an ornate ceiling inlaid with gold. Gold friezes ran about the base and the top of the walls, and there was no door other than the one through which he had entered. But he noted these details mechanically. His whole attention was centered on the shape which lay on an ivory dais before him. He had expected an image, probably carved with the skill of a forgotten art, but no art could mimic the perfection of the figure that lay before him. It was no effigy of stone or metal or ivory. It was the actual body of a woman, and by what dark art the ancients had preserved that form unblemished for so many ages, Conan could not even guess. The very garments she wore were intact, and Conan scowled at that, a vague uneasiness stirring at the back of his mind. The arts that preserved the body should not have affected the garments. Yet there they were, gold breastplates set with concentric circles of small gems, gilded sandals, and a short silken skirt upheld by a jeweled girdle. Neither cloth nor metal showed any signs of decay. Yelaya was coldly beautiful even in death. Her body was like alabaster, slender yet voluptuous. A great crimson jewel gleamed against the darkly piled foam of her hair. Conan stood frowning down at her and then tapped the dais with his sword. Possibilities of a hollow containing the treasure occurred to him, but the dais rang solid. He turned and paced the chamber in some indecision. Where should he search first, in the limited time at his disposal? The priest he had overheard babbling to a courtesan had said the treasure was hidden in the palace, but that included a space of considerable vastness. He wondered if he should hide himself until the priest had come and gone, and then renew the search. But there was a strong chance that they might take the jewels with them when they returned to Kishia, for he was convinced that Thutmekri had corrupted Gorulga. Conan could predict Thutmekri's plans from his knowledge of the man. He knew that it had been Thutmekri who had proposed the conquest of Punt to the kings of Zimbabwe, which conquest was but one move toward their real goal, the capture of the teeth of Gwalur. Those wary kings would demand proof that the treasure really existed before they made any move. The jewels that Mekri asked as a pledge would furnish that proof. With positive evidence of the treasure's reality, the kings of Zimbabwe would move. Punt would be invaded simultaneously from the east and the west. But the Zimbabweans would see to it that the Kashani did most of the fighting. And then, when both Punt and Kishan were exhausted from the struggle, the Zimbabweans would crush both races loot Kishan, and take the treasure by force, if they had to destroy every building and torture every living human in the kingdom. But there was always another possibility. If Thutmekri could get his hands on the hoard, it would be characteristic of the man to cheat his employers, steal the jewels for himself, and decamp, leaving the Zimbabwean emissaries holding the sack. 
Conan believed that this consulting of the oracle was but a ruse to persuade the king of Kishon to accede to Thutmekri's wishes, for he never for a moment doubted that Gorulga was as subtle and devious as all the rest mixed up in this grand swindle. Conan had not approached the high priest himself, because in the game of bribery he would have no chance against Thutmekri, and to attempt it would be to play directly into the Stygian's hands. Gorulga could denounce the Cimmerian to the people, establish a reputation for integrity, and rid Thutmekri of his rival at one stroke. He wondered how Thutmekri had corrupted the high priest, and just what could be offered as a bribe to a man who had the greatest treasure in the world under his fingers. At any rate, he was sure that the oracle would be made to say that the gods willed it that Kishan should follow Thutmekri's wishes, and he was sure, too, that it would drop a few pointed remarks concerning himself. After that, Kashia would be too hot for the Sumerian, nor had Conan had any intention of returning when he rode away in the night. The oracle chamber held no clue for him. He went forth into the great throne room and laid his hands on the throne. It was heavy, but he could tilt it up. The floor beneath... A thick marble dais was solid. Again he sought the alcove. His mind clung to a secret crypt near the oracle. Painstakingly he began to tap along the walls, and presently his taps rang hollow at a spot opposite the mouth of the narrow corridor. Looking more closely, he saw that the crack between the marble panel at that point and the next was wider than usual. He inserted a dagger point and pried. Silently the panel swung open, revealing a niche in the wall but nothing else. He swore feelingly. The aperture was empty, and it did not look as if it had ever served as a crypt for treasure. Leaning into the niche, he saw a system of tiny holes in the wall, about on a level with a man's mouth. He peered through and grunted understandingly. That was the wall that formed the partition between the alcove and the oracle chamber. Those holes had not been visible in the chamber. Conan grinned. This explained the mystery of the oracle, but it was a bit cruder than he had expected. Gorugo would plant either himself or some trusted minion in that niche to talk through the holes, and the credulous acolytes, black men all, would accept it as the veritable voice of Yaleya. Remembering something, the Sumerian drew forth the roll of parchment he had taken from the mummy and unrolled it carefully, as it seemed ready to fall to pieces with age. He scowled over the dim characters with which it was covered, in his roaming about the world, the giant adventurer had picked up a wide smattering of knowledge, particularly including the speaking and reading of many alien tongues. Many a sheltered scholar would have been astonished at the Sumerian's linguistic abilities, for he had experienced many adventures where knowledge of a strange language had meant the difference between life and death. These characters were puzzling, at once familiar and unintelligible, and presently he discovered the reason. They were the characters of archaic Polishtic, which possessed many points of difference from the modern script with which he was familiar, and which, three centuries ago, had been modified by conquest by a nomad tribe. This older, purer script baffled him. He made out a recurrent phrase, however, which he recognized as a proper name, Bit Yakin. He gathered that it was the name of the writer. Scowling, his lips unconsciously moving as he struggled with the task, he blundered through the manuscript, finding much of it untranslatable and most of the rest of it obscure. He gathered that the writer, the mysterious Bit Yakin, had come from afar with his servants and entered the valley of Alcmenon. Much that followed was meaningless, interspersed as it was with unfamiliar phrases and characters. Such as he could translate seemed to indicate the passing of a very long period of time. The name of Yaleya was repeated frequently, and toward the last part of the manuscript it became apparent that Bit Yakin knew that death was upon him. With a slight start, Conan realized that the mummy in the cavern must be the remains of the writer of the manuscript, the mysterious Pelishti Bit Yakin. The man had died as he had prophesied, and his servants, obviously, had placed him in that open crypt, high up on the cliffs, according to his instructions before his death. It was strange that Bit Yakin was not mentioned in any of the legends of Alcmenon. Obviously, he had come to the valley after it had been deserted by the original inhabitants. The manuscript indicated as much. But it seemed peculiar that the priests who came in the old days to consult the oracle had not seen the man or his servants. Conan felt sure that the mummy and this parchment was more than a hundred years old. Bit Yakin had dwelt in the valley when the priests came of old 
to bow before dead Yaleah. Yet concerning him, the legends were silent, telling only of a deserted city haunted only by the dead. Why had the man dwelt in this desolate spot, and to what unknown destination had his servants departed after disposing of their master's corpse? Conan shrugged his shoulders and thrust the parchment back into his girdle. He started violently, the skin on the backs of his hands tingling. Startlingly, shockingly, in the slumbering stillness, there had boomed the deep strident clangor of a great gong. He wheeled, crouching like a great cat, sword in hand, glaring down the narrow corridor from which the sound had seemed to come. Had the priests of Kishia arrived? This was improbable, he knew. They would not have had time to reach the valley, but that gong was indisputable evidence of human presence. Conan was basically a direct actionist. Such subtlety as he possessed had been acquired through contact with the more devious races. When taken off guard by some unexpected occurrence, he reverted instinctively to type. So now, instead of hiding or slipping away in the opposite direction as the average man might have done, he ran straight down the corridor in the direction of the sound. His sandals made no more sound than the pads of a panther would have made. His eyes were slits, his lips unconsciously a snarl. Panic had momentarily touched his soul at the shock of that unexpected reverberation, and the red rage of the primitive that is wakened by threat of peril always lurked close to the surface of the Cimmerian. He emerged presently from the winding corridor into a small open court. Something glinting in the sun caught his eye. It was the gong, a great gold disc, hanging from a gold arm extending from the crumbling wall. A brass mallet lay near, but there was no sound or sight of humanity. The surrounding arches gaped emptily. Conan crouched inside the doorway for what seemed a long time. There was no sound or movement throughout the great palace. His patience exhausted at last. He glided around the curve of the court, peering into the arches, ready to leap either way like a flash of light or to strike right or left as a cobra strikes. He reached the gong, stared into the arch nearest it. He saw only a dim chamber littered with the debris of decay. Beneath the gong the polished marble flags showed no footprint, but there was a scent in the air, a faintly fetid odor he could not classify. His nostrils dilated like those of a wild beast as he sought in vain to identify it. He turned toward the arch. With appalling suddenness the seemingly solid flags splintered and gave way under his feet. Even as he fell he spread wide his arms and caught the edges of the aperture that gaped beneath him. The edges crumbled off under his clutching fingers. Down into utter darkness he shot, into black icy water that gripped him and whirled him away with breathless speed. 2. A Goddess Awakens The Cimmerian at first made no attempt to fight the current that was sweeping him through lightless night. He kept himself afloat, gripping between his teeth the sword, which he had not relinquished even in his fall, and did not even seek to guess to what doom he was being born. But suddenly a beam of light lanced the darkness ahead of him. He saw the surging, seething black surface of the water in turmoil as if disturbed by some monster of the deep, and he saw the sheer stone walls of the channel curved up to a vault overhead. On each side ran a narrow ledge, just below the arching roof, but they were far out of his reach. At one point this roof had been broken, probably fallen in, and the light was streaming through the aperture. Beyond that shaft of light was utter blackness, and panic assailed the Sumerian as he saw he would be swept on past that spot of light and into the unknown blackness again. Then he saw something else. Bronze ladders extended from the ledges to the water's surface at regular intervals, and there was one just ahead of him. Instantly he struck out for it, fighting the current that would have held him to the middle of the stream. It dragged at him as with tangible, animate, slimy hands, but he buffeted the rushing surge with the strength of desperation and drew closer and closer inshore, fighting furiously for every inch. Now he was even with a ladder, and with a fierce, gasping plunge, he gripped the bottom rung and hung on, breathless. A few seconds later he struggled up out of the seething water, trusting his weight dubiously to the corroded rungs. They sagged and bent, but they held, and he clambered up onto the narrow ledge which ran along the wall, scarcely a man's length below the curving roof. The tall Cimmerian was forced to bend his head as he stood up. A heavy bronze door showed in the stone at a point even with the head of the ladder, but it did not give to Conan's efforts. He transferred his sword from his teeth to its scabbard, spitting blood, for the edge had cut his lips in that fierce fight with the river, and turned his attention to the broken roof. 
He could reach his arms up through the crevice and grip the edge, and careful testing told him it would bear his weight. An instant later he had drawn himself up through the hole and found himself in a wide chamber, in a state of extreme disrepair. Most of the roof had fallen in, as well as a great section of the floor which was laid over the vault of a subterranean river. Broken arches opened into other chambers and corridors, and Conan believed he was still in the great palace. He wondered uneasily how many chambers in that palace had underground water directly under them, and when the ancient flags or tiles might give way again and precipitate him back into the current from which he had just crawled. And he wondered just how much of an accident that fall had been. Had those rotten flags simply chanced to give way beneath his weight, or was there a more sinister explanation? One thing at least was obvious. He was not the only living thing in that palace. That gong had not sounded of its own accord, whether the noise had been meant to lure him to his death or not. The silence of the palace became suddenly sinister, fraught with crawling menace. Could it be someone on the same mission as himself? A sudden thought occurred to him at the memory of the mysterious Bit Yakim. Was it not possible that this man had found the teeth of Gwalur in his long residence in Alkminon, that his servants had taken them with them when they departed? The possibility that he might be following a will-o'-the-wisp infuriated the Sumerian. Choosing a corridor which he believed led back toward the part of the palace he had first entered, he hurried along it, stepping gingerly as he thought of that black river that seethed and foamed somewhere below his feet. His speculations recurrently revolved about the oracle chamber and its cryptic occupant. Somewhere in that vicinity must be the clue to the mystery of the treasure, if indeed it still remained in its immemorial hiding place. The great palace lay silent as ever, disturbed only by the swift passing of his sandaled feet. The chambers and halls he traversed were crumbling into ruin, but as he advanced, the ravages of decay became less apparent. He wondered briefly for what purpose the ladders had been suspended from the ledges over the subterranean river, but dismissed the matter with a shrug. He was little interested in speculating over unremunerative problems of antiquity. He was not sure just where the oracle chamber lay, from where he was, but presently he emerged into a corridor which led back into the great throne room under one of the arches. He had reached a decision. It was useless for him to wander aimlessly about the palace, seeking the hoard. He would conceal himself somewhere here, wait until the Kashani priests came, and then, after they had gone through the farce of consulting the oracle, he would follow them to the hiding place of the gems, to which he was certain they would go. Perhaps they would take only a few of the jewels with them. He would content himself with the rest. Drawn by a morbid fascination, he re-entered the oracle chamber and stared down again at the motionless figure of the princess who was worshipped as a goddess, entranced by her frigid beauty. What cryptic secret was locked in that marvelously molded form? He started violently. The breath sucked through his teeth, the short hairs prickled at the back of his scalp. The body still lay as he had first seen it, silent, motionless, in breastplates of jeweled gold, gilded sandals, and silken skirt. But now there was a subtle difference. The lissom limbs were not rigid. A peach bloom touched the cheeks. The lips were red. With a panicky curse, Conan ripped out his sword. Crum! She's alive! At his words, the long, dark lashes lifted. The eyes opened and gazed up at him inscrutably. Dark, lustrous, mystical. He glared in frozen speechlessness. She sat up with a supple ease, still holding his ensorcelled stare. He licked his dry lips and found voice. You are... are you Yelaya? he stammered. I am Yelaya. The voice was rich and musical, and he stared with new wonder. Do not fear. I will not harm you if you do my bidding. How can a dead woman come to life after all these centuries, he demanded, as if skeptical of what his senses told him. A curious gleam was beginning to smolder in his eyes. She lifted her arms in a mystical gesture. I am a goddess. A thousand years ago there descended upon me the curse of the greater gods, the gods of darkness beyond the borders of light. The mortal in me died. The goddess in me could never die. Here I have lain for so many centuries, to awaken each night at sunset and hold my court as of yore, with specters drawn from the shadows of the past. Man, if you would not view that which will blast your soul forever, 
Get hence quickly. I command you, go. The voice became imperious, and her slender arm lifted and pointed. Conan, his eyes burning slits, slowly sheathed his sword, but he did not obey her order. He stepped closer, as if impelled by a powerful fascination. Without the slightest warning, he grabbed her up in a bear-like grasp. She screamed a very ungoddess-like scream, and there was a sound of ripping silk, as with one ruthless wrench, he tore off her skirt. Goddess, ha! His bark was full of angry contempt. He ignored the frantic writhings of his captive. I thought it was strange that a princess of Alcminon would speak with a Corinthian accent. As soon as I'd gathered my wits, I knew I'd seen you somewhere. You're Muriela, Zargeba's Corinthian dancing girl. This crescent-shaped birthmark on your hip proves it. I saw it once, when Zargeba was whipping you. Goddess, bah! He smacked the betraying hip contemptuously and resoundingly with his open hand, and the girl yelped piteously. All her imperiousness had gone out of her. She was no longer a mystical figure of antiquity, but a terrified and humiliated dancing girl, such as can be bought at almost any Shemitish marketplace. She lifted up her voice and wept unashamedly. Her captor glared down at her with angry triumph. Goddess, ha! So you were one of the veiled women Zargeba brought to Kishia with him. Did you think you could fool me, you little idiot? A year ago I saw you in Akbitana with that swine Zargeba, and I don't forget faces or women's figures. I think I'll... Squirming about in his grasp, she threw her slender arms about his massive neck in an abandon of terror. Tears coursed down her cheeks and her sobs quivered with a note of hysteria. Oh, please don't hurt me. Don't. I had to do it. Zargeba brought me here to act as the oracle. Why, you sacrilegious little hussy, rumbled Conan. Do you not fear the gods? Crom, is there no honesty anywhere? Oh, please, she begged, quivering with abject fright. I couldn't disobey Zargeba. Oh, what shall I do? I shall be cursed by these heathen gods. What do you think the priests will do to you if they find out you're an impostor, he demanded. At the thought, her legs refused to support her, and she collapsed in a shuddering heap, clasping Conan's knees and mingling incoherent pleas for mercy and protection with piteous protestations of her innocence of any malign intention. It was a vivid change from her pose as the ancient princess, but not surprising. The fear that had nerved her then was now her undoing. Where is Zargeva? he demanded. Stop yammering, damn it, and answer me. Outside the palace, she whimpered, watching for the priests. How many men with him? None. We came alone. Ha! It was much like the satisfied grunt of a hunting lion. You must have left Kashia a few hours after I did. Did you climb the cliffs? She shook her head, too choked with tears to speak coherently. With an impatient imprecation, he seized her slim shoulders and shook her until she gasped for breath. Will you quit that blubbering and answer me? How did you get into the valley? Zargeba knew the secret way, she gasped. The priest Guarunga told him, and Thutmekri. On the south side of the valley there is a broad pool lying at the foot of the cliffs. There is a cave mouth under the surface of the water that is not visible to the casual glance. We ducked under the water and entered it. The cave slopes up out of the water swiftly and leads through the cliffs. The opening on the side of the valley is masked by heavy thickets. I climbed the cliffs on the east side, he muttered. Well, what then? We came to the palace, and Zargeba hid me among the trees while he went to look for the chamber of the oracle. I do not think he fully trusted Guarunga. While he was gone, I thought I heard a gong sound, but I was not sure. Presently Zargeba came and took me into the palace and brought me to this chamber, where the goddess Yalea lay upon the dais. He stripped the body and clothed me in the garments and ornaments. Then he went forth to hide the body and watch for the priests. I have been afraid. When you entered, I wanted to leap up and beg you to take me away from this place, but I feared Zargeba. When you discovered I was alive, I thought I could frighten you away. What were you to say as the oracle, he asked. I was to bid the priest to take the teeth of Gwalor and give some of them to Thutmikri as a pledge, as he desired, and place the rest in the palace at Kashia. I was to tell them that an awful doom threatened Kishan if they did not agree to Thutmikri's proposals, and, oh yes, I was to tell them that you were to be skinned alive immediately. Thutmikri wanted the treasure where he, or the Zimbabweans, could lay hand on it easily, muttered Conan, disregarding the remark concerning himself. I'll carve his liver yet. 
Garuga is a party to this swindle, of course. No, he believes in his gods and is incorruptible. He knows nothing about this. He will obey the oracle. It was all Thutmekri's plan. Knowing that Kishani would consult the oracle, he had Zargeba bring me with the embassy from Zimbabwe, closely veiled and secluded. Well, I'm damned, muttered Conan. A priest who honestly believes in his oracle and cannot be bribed. Crumb. I wonder if it was Zargeba who banged that gong. Did he know I was here? Could he have known about that rotten flagging? Where is he now, girl? Hiding in a thicket of lotus trees near the ancient avenue that leads from the south wall of the cliffs to the palace, she answered. Then she renewed her importunities. Oh, Conan, have pity on me. I am afraid of this evil ancient place. I know I have heard stealthy footfalls padding about me. Oh, Conan, take me away with you. Zargeba will kill me when I have served his purpose here. I know it. The priests, too, will kill me if they discover my deceit. He is a devil. He bought me from a slave trader who stole me out of a caravan bound through southern Koth, and has made me the tool of his intrigues ever since. Take me away from him. You cannot be as cruel as he. Don't leave me to be slain here. Please, please. She was on her knees, clutching at Conan hysterically, a beautiful tear-stained face upturned to him, her dark silken hair flowing in disorder over her white shoulders. Conan picked her up and set her on his knee. Listen to me. I'll protect you from Zaryeva. The priests shall not know of your perfidy, but you've got to do as I tell you. She faltered promises of explicit obedience, clasping his corded neck as if seeking security from the contact. Good. When the priests come, you'll act the part of Yalaya, as Zargeba planned. It'll be dark, and in the torchlight they'll never know the difference. But you'll say this to them. It is the will of the gods that the Stygian and his Shemitish dogs be driven from Kishan. They are thieves and traitors who plot to rob the gods. Let the teeth of Gwalur be placed in the care of the general Conan. Let him lead the armies of Kishan. He is beloved of the gods. She shivered with an expression of desperation, but acquiesced. But Zargeba, she cried, he'll kill me. Don't worry about Zargeba, he grunted. I'll take care of that dog. You do as I say. Here, put up your hair again. It's fallen all over your shoulders, and the gem's fallen out of it. He replaced the great glowing gem himself, nodding approval. It's worth a room full of slaves itself alone. Here, put your skirt back on. It's torn down the side, but the priests will never notice it. Wipe your face. A goddess doesn't cry like a whipped schoolgirl. By crime, you do look like Yalaya. Face, hair, figure and all. If you act the goddess with the priest as well as you did with me, you'll fool them easily. I'll try, she shivered. Good. I'm going to find Zargeba. At that she became panicky again. No, don't leave me alone. This place is haunted. There's nothing here to harm you, he assured her impatiently. Nothing but Zargeba, and I'm going to look after him. I'll be back shortly. I'll be watching from close by in case anything goes wrong during the ceremony. But if you play your part properly, nothing will go wrong. And turning, he hastened out of the oracle chamber. Behind him, Muriela squeaked wretchedly at his going. Twilight had fallen. The great rooms and halls were shadowy and indistinct. Copper friezes glinted dully through the dusk. Conan strode like a silent phantom through the great halls, with a sensation of being stared at from the shadowed recesses by invisible ghosts of the past. No wonder the girl was nervous amid such surroundings. He glided down the marble steps like a slinking panther, sword in hand. Silence reigned over the valley, and above the rim of the cliffs, stars were blinking out. If the priests of Kashia had entered the valley, there was not a sound, not a movement in the greenery to betray them. He made out the ancient, broken, paved avenue, wandering away to the south, lost amid clustering masses of fronds and thick-leaved bushes. He followed it warily, hugging the edge of the paving where the shrubs massed their shadows thickly, until he saw ahead of him, dimly in the dusk, the clump of lotus trees, the strange growth peculiar to the black lands of Kush. There, according to the girls, Argeba should be lurking. Conan became stealth personified. A velvet-footed shadow, he melted into the thicket. He approached the lotus grove by a circuitous movement, and scarcely the rustle of a leaf proclaimed his passing. At the edge of the trees he halted suddenly, crouched like a suspicious panther among the deep shrubs. Ahead of him, among the dense leaves, showed a pallid oval, dim in the uncertain light. 
It might have been one of the great white blossoms which shone thickly among the branches. But Conan knew that it was a man's face, and it was turned toward him. He shrank quickly deeper into the shadows. Had Zargeba seen him? The man was looking directly toward him. Seconds passed. That dim face had not moved. Conan could make out the dark tuft below that was the short black beard. And suddenly Conan was aware of something unnatural. Zargeba, he knew, was not a tall man. Standing erect, his head was scarcely top the Cimmerian's shoulder. Yet that face was on a level with Conan's own. Was the man standing on something? Conan bent and peered toward the ground below the spot where the face showed, but his vision was blocked by undergrowth and the thick boles of the trees. But he saw something else, and he stiffened. Through a slot in the underbrush, he glimpsed the stem of the tree under which, apparently, Zargebo was standing. The face was directly in line with that tree. He should have seen below that face, not the tree trunk, but Zargeba's body. But there was no body there. Suddenly, tenser than a tiger who stalks his prey, Conan glided deeper into the thicket, and a moment later drew aside a leafy branch and glared at the face that had not moved, nor would it ever move again of its own volition. He looked on Zargeba's severed head, suspended from the branch of the tree by its own long black hair. 3. The Return of the Oracle Conan wheeled supplely, sweeping the shadows with a fiercely questing stare. There was no sign of the murdered man's body. Only yonder the tall, lush grass was trampled and broken down, and the sward was dabbled darkly and wetly. Conan stood scarcely breathing as he strained his ears into the silence. The trees and bushes with their great pallid blossoms stood dark, still, and sinister, etched against the deepening dusk. Primitive fears whispered at the back of Conan's mind. Was this the work of the priests of Kishon? If so, where were they? Was it Zargeba, after all, who had struck the gong? Again there rose the memory of Bityakin and his mysterious servants. Bityakin was dead, shriveled to a hulk of wrinkled leather and bound in his hollowed crypt to greet the rising sun forever. But the servants of Bityakin were unaccounted for. There was no proof they had ever left the valley. Conan thought of the girl, Muriela, alone and unguarded in that great shadowy palace. He wheeled and ran back down the shadowed avenue, and he ran as a suspicious panther runs, poised even in full stride to whirl right or left and strike death blows. The palace loomed through the trees, and he saw something else, the glow of fire reflecting redly from the polished marble. He melted into the bushes that lined the broken street, glided through the dense growth, and reached the edge of the open space before the portico. Voices reached him. Torches bobbed and their flares shone on glossy ebon shoulders. The priests of Kishan had come. They had not advanced up the wide overgrown avenue, as Zargeba had expected them to do. Obviously, there was more than one secret way into the valley of Alkminon. They were filing up the broad marble steps, holding their torches high. He saw Garuga at the head of the parade, a profile chiseled out of copper, etched in the torch glare. The rest were acolytes, giant black men from whose skins the torches struck highlights. At the end of the procession there stalked a huge negro with an unusually wicked cast of countenance, at the sight of whom Conan scowled. That was Guarunga, whom Muriela had named as the man who had revealed the secret of the pool entrance to Zargeba. Conan wondered how deeply the man was in the intrigues of the Stygian. He hurried toward the portico, circling the open space to keep in the fringing shadows. They left no one to guard the entrance. The torches streamed steadily down the long, dark hall. Before they reached the double-valved door at the other end, Conan had mounted the outer steps and was in the hall behind them. Slinking swiftly along the column-lined wall, he reached the great door as they crossed the huge throne room, their torches driving back the shadows. They did not look back. In single file, their ostrich plumes nodding, their leopard-skin tunics contrasting curiously, with the marble and arabesqued metal of the ancient palace, they moved across the wide room and halted momentarily at the golden door to the left of the throne dais. Garuga's voice boomed eerily and hollowly in the great empty space, framed in sonorous phrases unintelligible to the lurking listener. Then the high priest thrust open the golden door and entered. 
bowing repeatedly from his waist, and behind him the torches sank and rose, showering flakes of flame as the worshippers imitated their master. The gold door closed behind them, shutting out sound and sight, and Conan darted across the throne chamber and into the alcove behind the throne. He made less sound than a wind blowing across the chamber. Tiny beams of light streamed through the apertures in the wall as he pried open the secret panel. Gliding into the niche, he peered through. Uriella sat upright on the dais, her arms folded, her head leaning back against the wall within a few inches of his eyes. The delicate perfume of her foamy hair was in his nostrils. He could not see her face, of course, but her attitude was as if she gazed tranquilly into some far gulf of space, over and beyond the shaven heads of the black giants who knelt before her. Conan grinned with appreciation. The little slut's an actress, he told himself. He knew she was shriveling with terror, but she showed no sign. In the uncertain flare of the torches, she looked exactly like the goddess he had seen lying on that same dais, if one could imagine that goddess imbued with vibrant life. Garuga was booming forth some kind of a chant in an accent unfamiliar to Conan, and which was probably some invocation in the ancient tongue of Alcminon, handed down from generation to generation of high priests. It seemed interminable. Conan grew restless. The longer the thing lasted, the more terrific would be the strain on Muriela. If she snapped, he hitched his sword and dagger forward. He could not see the little trollop tortured and slain by black men. But the chant, deep, low-pitched and indescribably ominous, came to a conclusion at last, and a shouted acclaim from the acolytes marked its period. Lifting his head and raising his arms toward the silent form on the dais, Garuga cried in the deep, rich resonance that was the natural attribute of the Kashani priest, O oh, great goddess, dweller with the great one of darkness, let thy heart be melted, thy lips opened for the ears of thy slave, whose head is in the dust beneath thy feet. Speak, great goddess of the holy valley, thou knowest the paths before us. The darkness that vexes us is as the light of the midday sun to thee. Shed the radiance of thy wisdom on the paths of thy servants, Tell us, O mouthpiece of the gods, what is their will concerning Thutmekri the Stygian? The high-piled, burnished mass of hair that caught the torchlight in dull bronze gleams quivered slightly. A gusty sigh rose from the blacks, half in awe, half in fear. Muriela's voice came plainly to Conan's ears in the breathless silence, and it seemed cold, detached, impersonal, though he winced at the Corinthian accent. It is the will of the gods that the Stygian and his Shemitish dogs be driven from Kishan. She was repeating his exact words. They are thieves and traitors who plot to rob the gods. Let the teeth of Gualo be placed in the care of the general Conan. Let him lead the armies of Kishan. He is beloved of the gods. There was a quiver in her voice as she ended, and Conan began to sweat, believing she was on the point of an hysterical collapse. But the blacks did not notice any more than they identified the Corinthian accent, of which they knew nothing. They smote their palms softly together, and a murmur of wonder and awe rose from them. Goruga's eyes glittered fanatically in the torchlight. Yelaya has spoken, he cried in an exalted voice. It is the will of the gods. Long ago, in the days of our ancestors, they were made taboo and hidden at the command of the gods, who wrenched them from the awful jaws of Gwalor, the king of darkness in the birth of the world. At the command of the gods, the teeth of Gwalur were hidden. At their command, they shall be brought forth again. O star-born goddess, give us your leave to go to the secret hiding place of the teeth to secure them for him whom the gods love. You have my leave to go, answered the false goddess, with an imperious gesture of dismissal that set Conan grinning again, and the priests backed out ostrich plumes and torches rising and falling with the rhythm of their genuflections. The gold door closed, and with a moan, the goddess fell back limply on the dais. Conan, she whimpered faintly. Conan! Shh! He hissed through the apertures, and turning, glided from the niche and closed the panel. A glimpse past the jam of the carven door showed him the torches receding across the great throne room, but he was at the same time aware of a radiance that did not emanate from the torches. 
He was startled, but the solution presented itself instantly. An early moon had risen, and its light slanted through the pierced dome by which some curious workmanship intensified the light. The shining dome of Alcmenon was no fable, then. Perhaps its interior was of the curious, whitely flaming crystal found only in the hills of the black countries. The light flooded the throne room and seeped into the chambers immediately adjoining. But as Conan made toward the door that led into the throne room, he was brought around suddenly by a noise that seemed to emanate from the passage that led off from the alcove. He crouched at the mouth, staring into it, remembering the clangor of the gong that had echoed from it to lure him into a snare. The light from the dome filtered only a little way into that narrow corridor and showed him only empty space. Yet he could have sworn that he had heard the furtive pad of a foot somewhere down it. While he hesitated, he was electrified by a woman's strangled cry from behind him. Bounding through the door behind the throne, he saw an unexpected spectacle in the crystal light. The torches of the priests had vanished from the great hall outside, but one priest was still in the palace, Warunga. His wicked features were convulsed with fury, and he grasped the terrified Muriela by the throat, choking her efforts to scream and plead, shaking her brutally. Traitress! Between his thick red lips, his voice hissed like a cobra. What game are you playing? Did not Zagaba tell you what to say? I, Thutnekri, told me. Are you betraying your master, or is he betraying his friends through you? Slut, I'll twist off your false head, but first I'll... A widening of his captive's lovely eyes as she stared over his shoulder warned the huge black. He released her and wheeled just as Conan's sword lashed down. The impact of the stroke knocked him headlong backward to the marble floor, where he lay twitching, blood oozing from a ragged gash in his scalp. Conan started toward him to finish the job, for he knew that the black's sudden movement had caused the blade to strike flat. But Muriela threw her arms convulsively about him. I've done as you ordered, she gasped hysterically. Take me away, oh, please take me away. We can't go yet, he grunted. I want to follow the priests and see where they get the jewels. There may be more loot hidden there, but you can go with me. Where's that gem you wore in your hair? It must have fallen out on the dais, she stammered, feeling for it. I was so frightened. When the priests left, I ran out to find you, and this big brute had stayed behind, and he grabbed me. Well, go get it while I dispose of this carcass, he commanded. Go on, that gem is worth a fortune itself. She hesitated, as if loath to return to that cryptic chamber. Then, as he grasped Guarunga's girdle and dragged him into the alcove, she turned and entered the oracle room. Conan dumped the senseless black on the floor and lifted his sword. The Cimmerian had lived too long in the wild places of the world to have any illusions about mercy. The only safe enemy was a headless enemy. But before he could strike, a startling scream checked the lifted blade. It came from the oracle chamber. Conan! Conan! She's come back! The shriek ended in a gurgle and a scraping shuffle. With an oath, Conan dashed out of the alcove, across the throne dais, and into the oracle chamber, almost before the sound had ceased. There he halted, glaring bewilderedly. To all appearances, Muriela lay placidly on the dais, eyes closed as if in slumber. What in thunder are you doing, he demanded acidly. Is this any time to be playing jokes? His voice trailed away. His gaze ran along the ivory thigh molded in the close-fitting silk skirt. That skirt should gape from girdle to hem. He knew because it had been his own hand that tore it, as he ruthlessly stripped the garment from the dancer's writhing body. But the skirt showed no rent. A single stride brought him to the dais, and he laid his hand on the ivory body, snatched it away as if it had encountered hot iron instead of the cold immobility of death. Crom, he muttered, his eyes suddenly slits of balefire. It's not Muriela, it's Yelaya. He understood now that frantic scream that had burst from Muriela's lips when she entered the chamber. The goddess had returned. The body had been stripped by Zargeba to furnish the accoutrements for the pretender. Yet now it was clad in silk and jewels as Conan had first seen it. A peculiar prickling made itself manifest among the short hairs at the base of Conan's scalp. Muriela! he shouted suddenly. Muriela! Where the devil are you? The walls threw back his voice mockingly. There was no entrance that he could see except the golden door, and none could have entered or departed through that without his knowledge. This much was indisputable. 
Yalaya had been replaced on the dais within the few minutes that had elapsed since Muriela had first left the chamber to be seized by Guarunga. His ears were still tingling with the echoes of Muriela's scream, yet the Corinthian girl had vanished as if into thin air. There was but one explanation. If he rejected the darker speculation that suggested the supernatural, somewhere in the chamber there was a secret door, and even as the thought crossed his mind, he saw it. In what had seemed a curtain of solid marble, a thin perpendicular crack showed, and in the crack hung a wisp of silk. In an instant he was bending over it. That shred was from Muriela's torn skirt. The implication was unmistakable. It had been caught in the closing door and torn off as she was borne through the opening by whatever grim beings were her captors. The bit of clothing had prevented the door from fitting perfectly into its frame. Thrusting his dagger point into the crack, Conan exerted leverage with a corded forearm. The blade bent, but it was of unbreakable Akbitanan steel. The marble door opened. Conan's sword was lifted as he peered into the aperture beyond, but he saw no shape of menace. Light filtering into the oracle chamber revealed a short flight of steps cut out of marble. Pulling the door back to its fullest extent, he drove his dagger into a crack in the floor, propping it open. Then he went down the steps without hesitation. He saw nothing, heard nothing. A dozen steps down, the stair ended in a narrow corridor which ran straight away into gloom. He halted suddenly, posed like a statue at the foot of the stair, staring at the paintings which frescoed the walls, half visible in the dim light which filtered down from above. The art was unmistakably Pelishti. He had seen frescoes of identical characteristics on the walls of Ascalun. But the scenes depicted had no connection with anything Pelishti, except for one human figure, frequently recurrent. A lean, white-bearded old man, whose racial characteristics were unmistakable. They seemed to represent various sections of the palace above. Several scenes showed a chamber he recognized as the oracle chamber, with the figure of Yalea stretched upon the ivory dais and huge black men kneeling before it. And there behind the wall in the niche lurked the ancient Pelishti. And there were other figures, too, figures that moved through the deserted palace, did the bidding of the Pelishti, and dragged unnameable things out of the subterranean river. In a few seconds Conan stood frozen, hitherto unintelligible phrases in the parchment manuscript blazed in his brain with chilling clarity. The loose bits of the pattern clicked into place. The mystery of Bit Yakin was a mystery no longer, nor the riddle of Bit Yakin's servants. Conan turned and peered into the darkness, an icy finger crawling along his spine. Then he went along the corridor, cat-footed and without hesitation, moving deeper and deeper into the darkness as he drew farther away from the stair. The air hung heavy with the odor he had scented in the court of the gong. Now, in utter blackness, he heard a sound ahead of him. The shuffle of bare feet or the swish of loose garments against stone, he could not tell which. But an instant later, his outstretched hand encountered a barrier, which he identified as a massive door of carved metal. He pushed against it fruitlessly, and his sword point sought vainly for a crack. It fitted into the sill and jams as if molded there. He exerted all his strength, his feet straining against the floor, the veins knotting in his temples. It was useless. A charge of elephants would scarcely have shaken that titanic portal. As he leaned there, he caught a sound on the other side that his ears instantly identified. It was the creak of rusty iron, like a lever scraping in its slot. Instinctively, action followed recognition so spontaneously that sound, impulse, and action were practically simultaneous. And as his prodigious bound carried him backward, there was the rush of a great bulk from above, and a thunderous crash filled the tunnel with deafening vibrations. Bits of flying splinters struck him. A huge block of stone, he knew from the sound, dropped on the spot he had just quitted. An instant slower thought or action, and it would have crushed him like an ant. Conan fell back. Somewhere on the other side of that metal door, Muriela was a captive, if she still lived. But he could not pass that door, and if he remained in the tunnel, another block might fall, and he might not be so lucky. It would do the girl no good for him to be crushed into a purple pulp. He could not continue his search in that direction. He must get above ground and look for some other avenue of approach. He turned and hurried toward the stair, sighing as he emerged into comparative radiance. 
And as he set foot on the first step, the light was blotted out, and above him the marble door rushed shut with a resounding reverberation. Something like panic seized the Cimmerian then, trapped in that black tunnel, and he wheeled on the stair, lifting his sword and glaring murderously into the darkness behind him, expecting a rush of ghoulish assailants. But there was no sound or movement down the tunnel. Did the men beyond the door, if they were men, believe that he had been disposed of by the fall of the stone from the roof, which had undoubtedly been released by some sort of machinery? Then why had the door been shut above him? Abandoning speculation, Conan groped his way up the steps, his skin crawling in anticipation of a knife in his back at every stride, yearning to drown his semi-panic in a barbarous burst of bloodletting. He thrust against the door at the top and cursed soulfully to find that it did not give to his efforts. Then, as he lifted his sword with his right hand to hew at the marble, his groping left encountered a metal bolt that evidently slipped into place at the closing of the door. In an instant he had drawn this bolt, and then the door gave to his shove. He bounded into the chamber like a slit-eyed, snarling incarnation of fury, ferociously desirous to come to grips with whatever enemy was hounding him. The dagger was gone from the floor. The chamber was empty, and so was the dais. Yalea had again vanished. By crumb, muttered the Cimmerian, is she alive after all? He strode out into the throne room, baffled, and then, struck by a sudden thought, stepped behind the throne and peered into the alcove. There was blood on the smooth marble where he had cast down the senseless body of Gwarunga. That was all. The black man had vanished as completely as Yalea. 4. The Teeth of Gwalor Baffled wrath confused the brain of Conan the Sumerian. He knew no more how to go about searching for Muriela than he had known how to go about searching for the Teeth of Gwalor. Only one thought occurred to him, to follow the priest. Perhaps at the hiding place of the treasure some clue would be revealed to him. It was a slim chance, but better than wandering about aimlessly. As he hurried through the great shadowy hall that led to the portico, he half expected the lurking shadows to come to life behind him with rending fangs and talons. But only the beat of his own rapid heart accompanied him into the moonlight that dappled the shimmering marble. At the foot of the wide steps he cast about in the bright moonlight for some sign to show him the direction he must go. And he found it. Petals scattered on the sward told where an arm or garment had brushed against a blossom-laden branch. Grass had been pressed down under heavy feet. Conan, who had tracked wolves in his native hills, found no insurmountable difficulty in following the trail of the Kashani priests. It led away from the palace, through masses of exotic scented shrubbery, where great pale blossoms spread their shimmering petals, through verdant tangled bushes that showered blooms at the touch, until he came at last to a great mass of rock that jutted like a titan's castle out from the cliffs at a point closest to the palace, which, however, was almost hidden from view by vine-interlaced trees. Evidently that babbling priest in Kashia had been mistaken when he said the teeth were hidden in the palace. This trail had led him away from the place where Muriela had disappeared, but a belief was growing in Conan that each part of the valley was connected with that palace by subterranean passages. Crouching in the deep velvet black shadows of the bushes, he scrutinized the great jut of rock which stood out in bold relief in the moonlight. It was covered with strange, grotesque carvings, depicting men and animals and half-bestial creatures that might have been gods or devils. The style of art differed so strikingly from that of the rest of the valley that Conan wondered if it did not represent a different era and race, and was itself a relic of an age lost and forgotten at whatever immeasurably distant date the people of Alcminon had found and entered the haunted valley. A great door stood open in the sheer curtain of the cliff, and a gigantic dragon's head was carved about it so that the open door was like the dragon's gaping mouth. The door itself was of carven bronze and looked to weigh several tons. There was no lock that he could see, but a series of bolts showing along the edge of the massive portal, as it stood open, told him that there was some system of locking and unlocking, a system doubtless known only to the priests of Kishan. The trail showed that Gorulga and his henchmen had gone through that door, but Conan hesitated. To wait until they emerged would probably mean to see the door locked in his face, and he might not be able to solve the mystery of its unlocking. 
On the other hand, if he followed them in, they might emerge and lock him in the cavern. Throwing caution to the winds, he glided through the great portal. Somewhere in the cavern were the priests, the teeth of Gualur, and perhaps a clue to the fate of Muriela. Personal risks had never yet deterred him from any purpose. Moonlight illumined for a few yards the wide tunnel in which he found himself. Somewhere ahead of him he saw a faint glow and heard the echo of a weird chanting. The priests were not so far ahead of him as he had thought. The tunnel debouched into a wide room before the moonlight played out, an empty cavern of no great dimensions, but with a lofty vaulted roof glowing with a phosphorescent encrustation, which, as Conan knew, was a common phenomenon in that part of the world. It made a ghostly half-light, in which he was able to see a bestial image squatting on a shrine, and the black mouths of six or seven tunnels leading off from the chamber. Down the widest of these, the one directly behind the squat image which looked toward the outer opening, he caught the gleam of torches wavering, whereas the phosphorescent glow was fixed, and heard the chanting increase in volume. Down it he went recklessly and was presently peering into a larger cavern than the one he had just left. There was no phosphorus here, but the light of the torches fell on a larger altar, and a more obscene and repulsive god squatting toad-like upon it. Before this repugnant deity, Garulga and his ten acolytes knelt, and beat their heads upon the ground while chanting monotonously. Conan realized why their progress had been so slow. Evidently approaching the secret crypt of the teeth was a complicated and elaborate ritual. He was fidgeting in nervous impatience before the chanting and bowing were over, but presently they rose and passed into the tunnel which opened behind the idol. Their torches bobbed away into the nighted vault, and he followed swiftly. Not much danger of being discovered. He glided along the shadows like a creature of the night, and the black priests were completely engrossed in their ceremonial mummery. Apparently they had not even noticed the absence of Quarunga. Emerging into a cavern of huge proportions, about whose upward-curving walls gallery-like ledges marched in tears, they began their worship anew before an altar which was larger, and a god which was more disgusting than any encountered thus far. Conan crouched in the black mouth of the tunnel, staring at the walls reflecting the lurid glow of the torches. He saw a carven stone stair winding up from tier to tier of the galleries. The roof was lost in darkness. He started violently, and the chanting broke off as the kneeling blacks flung up their heads. An inhuman voice boomed out high above them. They froze on their knees, their faces turned upward with a ghastly blue hue in the sudden glare of a weird light that burst blindingly up near the lofty roof and then burned with a throbbing glow. That glare lighted a gallery, and a cry went up from the high priest, echoed shudderingly by his acolytes. In the flash there had been briefly disclosed to them a slim white figure standing upright in a sheen of silk and a glint of jewel-crusted gold. Then the blaze smoldered to a throbbing, pulsing luminosity in which nothing was distinct, and that slim shape was but a shimmering blur of ivory. Yelea! screamed Gorulga, his brown features ashen. Why have you followed us? What is your pleasure? That weird, unhuman voice rolled down from the roof, re-echoing under that arching vault that magnified and altered it beyond recognition. Woe to the unbelievers! Woe to the false children of Kishia! Doomed to them which deny their deity! A cry of horror went up from the priests. Garulga looked like a shocked vulture in the glare of the torches. I do not understand, he stammered. We are faithful. In the chamber of the oracle, you told us. Do not heed what you heard in the chamber of the oracle, rolled that terrible voice, multiplied until it was as though a myriad of voices thundered and muttered the same warning. Beware of false prophets and false gods. A demon in my guise spoke to you in the palace, giving false prophecy. Now hearken and obey, for only I am the true goddess, and I give you one chance to save yourselves from doom. Take the teeth of Gualur from the crypt where they were placed so long ago. Alcminon is no longer holy, because it has been desecrated by blasphemers. Give the teeth of Gualur into the hands of Thutmekri, the Stygian, to place in the sanctuary of Dagon and Dirketo. Only this can save Kishan from the doom the demons of the night have plotted. Take the teeth of Gualur and go. Return instantly to Kashia. 
there, give the jewels to Thutmekri and seize the foreign devil Conan and flay him alive in the great square. There was no hesitation in obeying. Chattering with fear, the priests scrambled up and ran for the door that opened behind the bestial god. Gorulga led the flight. They jammed briefly in the doorway, yelping as wildly waving torches touched squirming black bodies. They plunged through, and the patter of their speeding feet dwindled down the tunnel. Conan did not follow. He was consumed with a furious desire to learn the truth of this fantastic affair. Was that indeed Yalea, as the cold sweat on the backs of his hands told him? Or was it that little hussy Muriela, turned traitress after all? If it was... Before the last torch had vanished down the black tunnel, he was bounding vengefully up the stone stair. The blue glow was dying down, but he could still make out that the ivory figure stood motionless on the gallery. His blood ran cold as he approached it, but he did not hesitate. He came on with his sword lifted and towered like a threat of death over the inscrutable shape. Yalea, he snarled. Dead as she has been for a thousand years. Ha! From the dark mouth of a tunnel behind him, a dark form lunged. But the sudden, deadly rush of unshod feet had reached the Cimmerian's quick ears. He whirled like a cat and dodged the blow aimed murderously at his back. As the gleaming steel in the dark hand hissed past him, he struck back with the fury of a roused python, and the long, straight blade impaled his assailant and stood out a foot and a half between his shoulders. So! Conan tore his sword free as the victim sagged to the floor, gasping and gurgling. The man writhed briefly and stiffened. In the dying light, Conan saw a black body and ebon countenance, hideous in the blue glare. He had killed Quarunga. Conan turned from the corpse to the goddess. Thongs about her knees and breast held her upright against a stone pillar, and her thick hair, fastened to the column, held her head up. At a few yards' distance, these bonds were not visible in the uncertain light. He must have come to after I descended into the tunnel, muttered Conan. He must have suspected I was down there. So he pulled out the dagger. Conan stooped and wrenched the identical weapon from the stiffening fingers, glanced at it and replaced it in his own girdle, and shut the door. Then he took Yalea to befool his brother idiots. That was he shouting a while ago. You couldn't recognize his voice under this echoing roof and that bursting blue flame. I thought it looked familiar. It's a trick of the Stygian priests. Thought Mekri must have given some of it to Gwarunga. The man could easily have reached this cavern ahead of his companions. Evidently familiar with the plan of the caverns by hearsay or by maps handed down in the priestcraft, he had entered the cave after the others, carrying the goddess, followed a circuitous route through the tunnels and chambers, and ensconced himself and his burden on the balcony while Garulga and the other acolytes were engaged in their endless rituals. The blue glare had faded, but now Conan was aware of another glow, emanating from the mouth of one of the corridors that opened on the ledge. Somewhere down that corridor there was another field of phosphorus, for he recognized the faint, steady radiance. The corridor led in the direction the priests had taken, and he decided to follow it, rather than descend into the darkness of the great cavern below. Doubtless it was connected with another gallery in some other chamber, which might be the destination of the priests. He hurried down it, the illumination growing stronger as he advanced, until he could make out the floor and the walls of the tunnel. Ahead of him and below, he could hear the priests chanting again. Abruptly, a doorway in the left-hand wall was limned in the phosphorus glow, and to his ears came the sound of soft, hysterical sobbing. He wheeled and glared through the door. He was looking again into a chamber hewn out of solid rock, not a natural cavern like the others. The domed roof shone with the phosphorus light, and the walls were almost covered with arabesques of beaten gold. Near the farther wall on a granite throne, staring forever toward the arched doorway, sat the monstrous and obscene Ptior, the god of the Pelisti, wrought in brass, with his exaggerated attributes reflecting the grossness of his cult, and in his lap sprawled a limp white figure. Well, I'll be damned, muttered Conan. He glanced suspiciously about the chamber, seeing no other entrance or evidence of occupation, and then advanced noiselessly and looked down at the girl, whose slim shoulders shook with sobs of abject misery, her face sunk in her arms. From thick bands of gold on the idol's arms, slim gold chains ran to smaller bands on her wrists. He laid a hand on her naked shoulder, and she started convulsively, shrieked, and twisted her tear-stained face toward him. Conan! 
She made a spasmodic effort to go into the usual clinch, but the chains hindered her. He cut through the soft gold as close to her wrist as he could, grunting, You'll have to wear these bracelets until I can find a chisel or a file. Let go of me, damn it. You actresses are too damned emotional. What happened to you, anyway? When I went back into the oracle chamber, she whimpered, I saw the goddess lying on the dais as I'd first seen her. I called out to you and started to run to the door. Then something grabbed me from behind. It clapped a hand over my mouth and carried me through a panel in the wall and down some steps and along a dark hall. I didn't see what it was that had hold of me until we passed through a big metal door and came into a tunnel whose roof was alight like this chamber. Oh, I nearly fainted when I saw. They are not humans. They are gray, hairy devils that walk like men and speak a gibberish no human could understand. They stood there and seemed to be waiting, and once I thought I heard somebody trying the door. Then one of the things pulled a metal lever in the wall, and something crashed on the other side of the door. Then they carried me on and on through winding tunnels and up stone stairways into this chamber, where they chained me on the knees of this abominable idol, and then they went away. Oh, Conan, what are they? Servants of Bityakin, he grunted. I found a manuscript that told me a number of things, and then stumbled upon some frescoes that told me the rest. Bityakin was a Palisti who wandered into the valley with his servants after the people of Alcminon had deserted it. He found the body of Princess Yalea, and discovered that the priest returned from time to time to make offerings to her, for even then she was worshipped as a goddess. He made an oracle of her, and he was the voice of the oracle, speaking from a niche he cut in the wall behind the ivory dais. The priests never suspected, never saw him or his servants, for they always hid themselves when the men came. Bit Yakin lived and died here without ever being discovered by the priests. Crom knows how long he dwelt here, but it must have been for centuries. The wise men of the Palishti know how to increase the span of their lives for hundreds of years. I've seen some of them myself. Why he lived here alone and why he played the part of Oracle, no ordinary human can guess. But I believe the oracle part was to keep the city inviolate and sacred, so he could remain undisturbed. He ate the food the priests brought as an offering to Yalea, and his servants ate other things. I've always known there was a subterranean river flowing away from the lake where the people of the Puntish highlands throw their dead. That river runs under this palace. They have ladders hung over the water where they can hang and fish for the corpses that come floating through. Bityakin recorded everything on parchment and painted walls. But he died at last and his servants mummified him according to instructions he gave them before his death, and stuck him in a cave in the cliffs. The rest is easy to guess. His servants, who were even more nearly immortal than he, kept on dwelling here, but the next time a high priest came to consult the oracle, not having a master to restrain them, they tore him to pieces. So since then, until Guruga, nobody came to talk to the oracle. It's obvious they've been renewing the garments and ornaments of the goddess, as they'd seen Bityakin do. Doubtless there's a sealed chamber somewhere where the silks are kept from decay. They clothed the goddess and brought her back to the article room after Zargeba had stolen her. And, oh, by the way, they took off Zargeba's head and hung it up in a thicket. She shivered, yet at the same time breathed a sigh of relief. He'll never whip me again. Not this side of hell, agreed Conan. But come on, Guarunga ruined my chances with his stolen goddess. I'm going to follow the priests and take my chance of stealing the loot from them after they get it. And you stay close to me. I can't spend all my time looking for you. But the servants of Bityakin, she whispered fearfully. We'll have to take our chance, he grunted. I don't know what's in their minds, but so far they haven't shown any disposition to come out and fight in the open. Come on. Taking her wrist, he led her out of the chamber and down the corridor. As they advanced... They heard the chanting of the priests, and mingling with the sound, the low, sullen rushing of waters. The light grew stronger above them as they emerged on a high-pitched gallery of a great cavern and looked down on a scene weird and fantastic. Above them gleamed the phosphorescent roof. A hundred feet below them stretched the smooth floor of the cavern. On the far side, this floor was cut by a deep, narrow stream brimming its rocky channel. Rushing out of impenetrable gloom, it swirled across the cavern and was lost again in darkness. The visible surface reflected the radiance above. The dark, seething waters glinted as if flecked with living jewels, frosty blue, lurid red, shimmering green, and ever-changing iridescence. Conan and his companions stood upon one of the gallery-like ledges that banded the curve of the lofty wall, 
and from this ledge, a natural bridge of stone soared in a breathtaking arch over the vast gulf of the cavern to join a much smaller ledge on the opposite side, across the river. Ten feet below it, another broader arch spanned the cave. At either end, a carved stair joined the extremities of these flying arches. Conan's gaze, following the curve of the arch that swept away from the ledge on which they stood, caught a glint of light that was not the lurid phosphorus of the cavern. On that small ledge opposite them, there was an opening in the cave wall through which stars were glinting. But his full attention was drawn to the scene beneath them. The priests had reached their destination. There, in a sweeping angle of the cavern wall, stood a stone altar, but there was no idol upon it. Whether there was one behind it, Conan could not ascertain, because some trick of the light or the sweep of the wall left the space behind the altar in total darkness. The priests had stuck their torches into holes in the stone floor, forming a semicircle of fire in front of the altar at a distance of several yards. Then the priests themselves formed a semicircle inside the crescent of torches, and Guruga, after lifting his arms aloft in invocation, bent to the altar and laid hands on it. It lifted and tilted backward on its hinder edge like the lid of a chest, revealing a small crypt. Extending a long arm into the recess, Guruga brought up a small brass chest. Lowering the altar back into place, he set the chest on it and threw back the lid. To the eager watchers on the high gallery, it seemed as if the action had released a blaze of living fire which throbbed and quivered about the open chest. Conan's heart leaped and his hand caught at his hilt. The teeth of Gwalur at last! The treasure that would make its possessor the richest man in the world! His breath came fast between his clenched teeth. Then he was suddenly aware that a new element had entered into the light of the torches and of the phosphorescent roof, rendering both void. Darkness stole around the altar, except for that glowing spot of evil radiance cast by the teeth of Gwalur, and that grew and grew. The blacks froze into basaltic statues, their shadows streaming grotesquely and gigantically out behind them. The altar was laved in the glow now, and the astounded features of Gorogo stood out in sharp relief. Then the mysterious space behind the altar swam into the widening illumination, and slowly, with the crawling light, figures became visible, like shapes growing out of the night and silence. At first they seemed like grey stone statues, those motionless shapes, hairy, man-like, yet hideously human. But their eyes were alive, cold sparks of grey icy fire, and as the weird glow lit their bestial countenances, Groga screamed and fell backward, throwing up his long arms in a gesture of frenzied horror. But a longer arm shot across the altar, and a misshapen hand locked on his throat. Screaming and fighting, the high priest was dragged back across the altar. A hammer-like fist smashed down, and Gorulga's cries were stilled. Limp and broken, he sagged across the altar, his brains oozing from his crushed skull. And then the servants of Bityakin surged like a bursting flood from hell on the black priests who stood like horror-blasted images. Then there was slaughter, grim and appalling. Conan saw black bodies tossed like chaff in the inhuman hands of the slayers, against whose horrible strength and agility the daggers and swords of the priests were ineffective. He saw men lifted bodily and their heads cracked open against the stone altar. He saw a flaming torch grasped in a monstrous hand, thrust inexorably down the gullet of an agonized wretch who writhed in vain against the arms that pinioned him. He saw a man torn in two pieces, as one might tear a chicken, and the bloody fragments hurled clear across the cavern. The massacre was as short and devastating as the rush of a hurricane. In a burst of red, abysmal ferocity it was over, except for one wretch who fled screaming back the way the priests had come, pursued by a swarm of blood-dabbled shapes of horror which reached out their red-smeared hands for him. Fugitive and pursuers vanished down the black tunnel, and the screams of the human came back dwindling and confused by the distance. Uriella was on her knees, clutching Conan's legs, her face pressed against his knee and her eyes tightly shut. She was a quaking, quivering mold of abject terror. But Conan was galvanized. A quick glance across at the aperture where the stars shone, a glance down at the chest that still blazed open on the blood-smeared altar, and he saw and seized the desperate gamble. I'm going after that chest, he grated. Stay here. Oh, Mitra, no! In an agony of fright, she fell to the floor and caught at his sandals. Don't, don't, don't leave me! Lie still and keep your mouth shut, he snapped, disengaging himself from her frantic clasp. He disregarded the tortuous stare. He dropped from ledge to ledge with reckless haste. 
There was no sign of the monsters as his feet hit the floor. A few of the torches still flared in their sockets. The phosphorescent glow throbbed and quivered, and the river flowed with an almost articulate muttering, scintillant with undreamed radiances. The glow that had heralded the appearance of the servants had vanished with them. Only the light of the jewels in the brass chest shimmered and quivered. He snatched the chest, noting its contents in one lustful glance, strange, curiously shapen stones that burned with an icy, non-terrestrial fire. He slammed the lid, thrust the chest under his arm, and ran back up the steps. He had no desire to encounter the hellish servants of Beat Yakin. His glimpse of them in action had dispelled any illusion concerning their fighting ability. Why they had waited so long before striking at the invaders, he was unable to say. What human could guess the motives or thoughts of these monstrosities? That they were possessed of craft and intelligence equal to humanity had been demonstrated. And there on the cavern floor lay crimson proof of their bestial ferocity. The Corinthian girl still cowered on the gallery where he had left her. He caught her wrist and yanked her to her feet, grunting, I guess it's time to go. To be amused with terror, to be fully aware of what was going on, the girl suffered herself to be led across the dizzy span. It was not until they were poised over the rushing water that she looked down, voiced a startled yelp, and would have fallen but for Conan's massive arm about her. Growling an objurgation in her ear, he snatched her up under his free arm and swept her, in a flutter of limply waving arms and legs, across the arch and into the aperture that opened at the other end. Without bothering to set her on her feet, he hurried through the short tunnel into which this aperture opened. An instant later they emerged upon a narrow ledge on the outer side of the cliffs that circles the valley. Less than a hundred feet below them, the jungle waved in the starlight. Looking down, Conan vented a gusty sigh of relief. He believed that he could negotiate the descent, even though burdened with the jewels and the girl, although he doubted if even he, unburdened, could have ascended at that spot. He set the chest, still smeared with Garulga's blood and clotted with his brains, on the ledge, and was about to remove his girdle in order to tie the box to his back, when he was galvanized by a sound behind him, a sound sinister and unmistakable. Stay here, he snapped at the bewildered Corinthian girl. Don't move. And drawing his sword, he glided into the tunnel, glaring back into the cavern. Halfway across the upper span, he saw a gray, deformed shape. One of the servants of Bit Yakin was on his trail. There was no doubt that the brute had seen them and was following them. Conan did not hesitate. It might be easier to defend the mouth of the tunnel, but this fight must be finished quickly before the other servants could return. He ran out on the span straight toward the oncoming monster. It was no ape, neither was it a man. It was some shambling horror spawned in the mysterious nameless jungles of the south where strange life teemed in the reeking rot without the dominance of man and drums thundered in temples that had never known the tread of a human foot. How the ancient Polisti had gained lordship over them, and with it eternal exile from humanity, was a foul riddle about which Conan did not care to speculate, even if he had had opportunity. Man and monster, they met at the highest arch of the span, where, a hundred feet below, rushed the furious black water. As the monstrous shape, with its leprous gray body and the features of a carven, unhuman idol loomed over him, Conan struck as a wounded tiger strikes, with every ounce of few and fury behind the blow. That stroke would have sheared a human body asunder, but the bones of the servant of Bityakin were like tempered steel. Yet even tempered steel could not wholly have withstood that furious stroke. Ribs and shoulder bone parted, and blood spouted from the great gash. There was no time for a second stroke. Before the Cimmerian could lift his blade again or spring clear, the sweep of a giant arm knocked him from the span as a fly is flicked from a wall. As he plunged downward, the rush of the river was like a knell in his ears, but his twisting body fell halfway across the lower arch. He wavered there precariously for one blood-chilling instant, then his clutching fingers hooked over the farther edge, and he scrambled to safety, his sword still in his other hand. As he sprang up, he saw the monster, spurting blood hideously, rush toward the cliff end of the bridge, obviously intending to descend the stair that connected the arches and renew the feud. At the very ledge, the brute paused in mid-flight, and Conan saw it too. Muriela, with a jewel chest under her arm, stood staring wildly in the mouth of the tunnel. With a triumphant bellow, the monster scooped her up under one arm, snatched the jewel chest with the other hand as she dropped it, and turning, lumbered back across the bridge. Conan cursed with passion and ran for the other side also. 
He doubted if he could climb the stair to the higher arch in time to catch the brute before it could plunge into the labyrinths of tunnels on the other side. But the monster was slowing, like clockwork running down. Blood gushed from that terrible gash in his breast, and he lurched drunkenly from side to side. Suddenly he stumbled, reeled, and toppled sidewise, pitched headlong from the arch, and hurtled downward. Girl and jewel chest fell from his nerveless hands, and Muriel's scream rang terribly above the snarl of the water below. Conan was almost under the spot from which the creature had fallen. The monster struck the lower arch glancingly and shot off, but the writhing figure of the girl struck and clung, and the chest hit the edge of the span near her. One falling object struck on one side of Conan and one on the other. Either was within arm's length. For the fraction of a split second, the chest teetered on the edge of the bridge, and Muriela clung by one arm, her face turned desperately toward Conan, her eyes dilated with the fear of death, and her lips parted in a haunting cry of despair. Conan did not hesitate, nor did he even glance toward the chest that held the wealth of an epoch. With a quickness that would have shamed the spring of a hungry jaguar, he swooped, grasped the girl's arm just as her fingers slipped from the smooth stone, and snatched her up on the span with one explosive heave. The chest toppled on over and struck the water ninety feet below, where the body of the servant of Bit Yakin had already vanished. A splash, a jetting flash of foam, marked where the teeth of Gualur disappeared forever from the sight of man. Conan scarcely wasted a downward glance. He darted across the span and ran up the cliff stair like a cat, carrying the limp girl as if she had been an infant. A hideous ululation caused him to glance over his shoulder as he reached the higher arch, to see the other servants streaming back into the cavern below, blood dripping from their bared fangs. They raced up the stair that wound from tier to tier, roaring vengefully, but he slung the girl unceremoniously over his shoulder, dashed through the tunnel, and went down the cliffs like an ape himself, dropping and swinging from hole to hole with breakneck recklessness. When the fierce countenances looked over the ledge of the aperture, it was to see the Cimmerian and the girl disappearing into the forest that surrounded the cliffs. Well, said Conan, setting the girl on her feet within the sheltering screen of branches, we can take our time now. I don't think those brutes will follow us outside the valley. Anyway, I've got a horse tied at a waterhole close by, if the lions haven't eaten him. Crumbs, devils, what are you crying about now? She covered her tear-stained face with her hands, and her slim shoulders shook with sobs. "'I lost the jewels for you,' she wailed miserably. "'It was my fault. If I'd obeyed you and stayed out on the ledge, that brute would never have seen me. You should have caught the gems and let me drown.' "'Yes, I suppose I should,' he agreed. "'But forget it. Never worry about what's past. And stop crying, will you? That's better. Come on.' "'You mean—' You're going to keep me? Take me with you? She asked, hopefully. What else do you suppose I'd do with you? He ran an approving glance over her figure and grinned at the torn skirt which revealed a generous expanse of tempting ivory-tinted curves. I can use an actress like you. There's no use going back to Kashia. There's nothing in Kishan now that I want. We'll go to Punt. The people of Punt worship an ivory woman, and they wash gold out of the rivers in wicker baskets. I'll tell them that Kishan is intriguing with Thutmekri to enslave them, which is true, and that the gods have sent me to protect them for about a house full of gold. If I can manage to smuggle you into their temple to exchange places with their ivory goddess, we'll skin them out of their jaw teeth before we get through with them. 